your ears do not deceive you. You have just entered the Cryptid Creator Corner brought to you by your friends at Comic Book Yeti. So without further ado, let's get on to the interview. This is Byron O'Neill sitting down today with Zach Kaplan to talk about his new Dark Horse sci-fi project, Breakout. Welcome and thanks for joining me today, Zach. Hey, thanks for having me. So tell me a little about Breakout. What's it about? Uh, Breakout is a, a sci-fi um, <laughs> sci action adventure thriller, uh, prison heist, uh, teen character drama. So it's just a mix of all sorts of things. But the, uh, the basic uh, idea is uh, uh, spaceships have uh, materialized over, sh over cities all over the, the country, all over the world, and uh, they start abducting only young people. And uh, after a short time of trying to handle the problem, uh, the governments of the world just kind of say, uh, there's nothing we can do about it, go on with your lives. And uh, it follows a group of teenagers who decide they're not gonna do that. A couple of their loved ones get uh, taken most specifically, the hero is named Liam Watson. His brother gets abducted, and uh, that his brother's being held up there in that mysterious prison, and he decides he's going to plan a an Ocean's Eleven style prison break. And um, yeah, so it's a it's a, a real mash of a lot of different things, but obviously there's an allegory there to uh, some things that are going on in today's society, and just in general about how we pass on. Um, some of the problems to younger people or kind of tell them that they have to live with them and what young people do in those situations. Yeah, after reading and catching up on the first issue there, it was this really strange kind of pleasant amalgamation of, of all these different things. As you mentioned, Ocean's Eleven, I got some like Star Trek first contact in there. There's elements that remind me of the Matrix. And it's safe to say that sci-fi fans will absolutely adore it. What were some of your inspiration that kind of colored the narration in the book? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, obviously, uh, it's an arrival story, um, even though um, these are not aliens, and I won't give away uh, much more than that. But um, there is a, a mystery to where these ships have come from and what they are. But nonetheless, they are arriving here to our world. And so whether it's some um, first contact or arrival or Independence Day or any of the uh, alien arrival um, stories, and then mix that with abduction stories or stories of living with um, with the, the threat of, a, uh, of abduction, alien abduction or supernatural abduction. I mean, that's obviously a reference point. I love a good heist. And I think this, the, the idea for the story probably um, began with that. It began with me loving whether it's Sting or The Italian Job or Mission Impossible. Um, just loving a taut heist or taut prison break thriller and kind of wanting, you know, they say, write what you want to read. And I really wanted to read a heist or prison break um, with sci-fi, with a real kind of, well, what about a spaceship, you know? And um, so definitely looking at all of those um, touchstones that I just mentioned to kind of um, you know, understand uh, how the planning uh, unfolds in stories like this, how putting the crew together, all the classic tropes of uh, using the, the, the thing you don't think they're going to use to overcome a high tech problem and then things go wrong and all of that. But I think finally, you know, once I realized that this was a story about young people dealing with this situation, it really became uh, important to look at a lot of stories that were adventure stories, but that were youth empowerment stories and stories about young people really um, taking matters into their own hands. And I think that's a common trope, whether it's Goonies or Stranger Things, which are more nostalgic in nature. I mean, this is a very modern uh, story, but uh, it nonetheless involves that classic uh, premise, which is grownups in society say, this is the way things need to be. And young people wonder, well, what, why, you know, why do they have to be that way? Why, what can we do about it? And um, so I think there are lots of, um, you know, adventure stories. I'm trying to think what other ones I, I looked at besides those. I mean, I'm a child of the eighties and of Spielberg and, and, and there's lots of um, stories like that. I think um, that the DNA is in my bones and it probably comes out a little bit, but um, you know, it was important to, to give this story a modern life as well. So those are some of the touchstones. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it feels uh, as much a story about friendship, courage, growing up, facing adversity, as it is anything about a space cube abduction. So what would you really like to re leave the, the reader with at the end? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think that I think that I'm liking. I'm, I'm asking this kind of a a question about what are we to do about the problems that society faces and how older generations deal with them and how younger generations deal with them. And I think that older generations use a lot of. Um, obviously, there's some people that just don't they ignore a problem or they don't address a problem or they don't believe in problems you know um that we face and that's an issue in and of itself this is more even um looking at the the people in society that recognize that certain problems are real and are happening and they want to solve them but then they use pragmatism and compromise and there's just not a rush to solve those problems quickly and yet young people are, it's taking a toll on their future and on their lives. And so I think that, I think that there should, I think it's a question to readers, well, what should be done about this? I think that definitely there's something about maybe relying on young people more, listening to them and trusting them. I mean, one thing that really stood out to me uh, in my mind as I was writing this story was um, what happened at Parkland. Mm -hmm. and how it was just such a tragic situation but it was just one of one tragic school shooting at, that had in a long line of tragic school shootings and you know the natural response was this is awful and um everyone's trying their best to rectify this in a in a pragmatic and compromising way and god bless these young people for their passion and for what they went through they turned their pain and their trauma into um empowerment and they took to uh, the streets and they, you know, they spoke out and they said, you know, we want more and here's what we want. And, uh, you know, you know, I think there were a lot of people that probably didn't think they were going to make much headway and we can debate about how much headway they made uh, and debate about that problem. But I think ultimately to be able to go through a traumatic experience or to be able to face something that society says, this is the way it is. And then to say, no, we don't accept that and we're going to stand up and we're going to do something about it i thought that's really pretty powerful and uh so i think that was really staying with me and so i think it's you know i i don't like to write with them um i don't like to preach per se i like to raise a a, a question and a conversation and 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 let you know hopefully maybe this will inspire some good thought-provoking uh, dialogue amongst readers yeah, I, mean, I have a, a teenager myself, and although it doesn't feel like you are actually targeting that YA market specifically, it does a really good job of translating teenage world, teenage experience. So how do you step back in time as a writer to that like kind of most awkward developmental period and, and do it justice and make it feel authentic? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think it was, you know, there's some small things like recognizing that the teenagers talk differently when they're with each other versus sure. when they're with, with grown-ups. And um and I think teenagers feel differently when they're with when, the, when they're with each other. So you know um recognizing that that teenagers actually exist with multiple different layers and different levels. And I think that teenagers are willing to imagine and brainstorm and talk with each other about all sorts of plans and ideas and goals and dreams that that then when they talk to grownups, they don't. So I think that's that was a really important facet here, and um, you know, trying to trying my best to um, to make them unique and different and, and smart and um, you know um, and and human and authentic. I think that uh, you know I'm not trying to pull off catching the rye here in terms of you know <laughs> stepping into a, a, and perfectly emulating a, a teenager's voice. I'm not a teenager. I'm not a young person per se, but I think that um, it's it's important. I mean, making a team, making these these young people three dimensional, giving them hopes, giving them fears, giving them doubts, um, showing that the um goals that they're considering are not just coming from a, a plot standpoint but they're coming from pain i mean 
the protagonist, for example, is a very multi-layered uh, character. You know, he, um, I don't think I'm spoiling here. Um, he, you know, he, he lost his father and uh, he um, is, is now without a dad and he's taken on the responsibility of being there for his brother and then his brother's abducted. So he feels a, a amount of responsibility and guilt. There's all, there's layers of survivor's guilt going on here uh, of being the one that got left behind and you don't feel like you should be the one that is left behind and, and what's his future gonna hold. And, uh, you know, there's just lots of layers. And so I think weaving those facets into this very high concept prison break idea, you know, that 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 helps to make those young people feel real. Well, you've got this uh, crack team of high school students with all these varied skills. I feel like I need to cue like Mission Impossible music or something here. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell me you threw a bone to some of your old high school friends and at least a few of that team were modeled after at least a couple um, of them. No, you know, I, I grew up in, in, uh, in Florida in the 90s, and um, I did not, uh, I don't think that, um, I don't know, I'm not sure my high school, <laughs> we were cut out for it. I mean, that, that's the thing, though. That's why I really was excited not to do a nostalgic or a period uh, story like this to make this modern, because young people today are so empowered and I mean, they've got the world at their fingertips with technology and the internet and devices. So being able to think about the things that they can tackle and do by going on to the web and getting, getting things and having them delivered to their door. I mean, I couldn't do that. You know, I couldn't go get scuba gear or whatever I need for a mission. I mean, it would have been much harder. And so I think that, um, no, the young people today are far more interesting, far more empowered than, than I was growing up and then my friends were growing up and I think um uh so no I did not think to um I did not think to uh tap into my own uh teenage friends <laughs> to their to their you know better for them not to be in this you know so tell me about the rest of the creative team let's start with Wilton Santos the artist so visually it's frenetic there, there's a really rapid sequencing of the panels. Some of them are broken with characters' heads. Their arrangement fluctuates a lot. Gutters vary in sizes. The color ranges dramatically. How did you two hook up? And kind of how much direction did you give him with the artwork? Yeah, um, I mean, he's great. And he comes from, you know, he had done some Star Wars and a little bit of um, Marvel, Marvel stuff, but I don't think he had done creator owned or certainly not much. Um, I was looking for an artist that really would bring their perspective to this and, and be open to the world building, um, which he was fantastic on both fronts. But more so, uh, I needed someone that captured um, character and young people. Um, you know, I, uh, I decided that that was the, the, the place to start more so than the sci-fi. Um, and he just, when I looked at his work, I really felt dimension and heart to his characters and i think that really comes across uh we collaborated heavily you know we at the design phase in the um in the world building figuring out what everything was going to look like and um you know i i told him early on that i wanted to take some chances and risks using layout using the page to kind of um show some of these things um and he was up for it and he he really just does an, a magnificent job. I mean, there's one, it, it varies a lot. You know, there's some, um, sometimes where we, there's one opening scene where they're running through the hallways in a safety drill at school. And suddenly the row goes backwards on the page. And, you know, it creates this really confusing, uh, claustrophobic energy that's perfect for the scene because that's what those, they're feeling at the time. And then there's a, a montage of, him talking about everything that's happening and there's these cubes just everywhere on the page and it, it really makes you feel under attacked by this presence and so yeah Wilton is a star uh real real rising talent just just poured his heart into these characters into the world and just uh, it was it was a joy to collaborate with him yeah yeah and, and Jason Wordy's color was is gorgeous he was able to take those really heavy visual elements and make them feel like nuanced and vibrant. 
for me, I find lots of sci-fi comic work to kind of get lost in the details of that material culture when they're, you know, attempting to establish how things look, but it ends up being dark and oppressive. You know, it wasn't that way at all here. So brag on Jason a little bit. I, I would love to brag on Jason. <laughs> I've, I've been a fan of Jason Wordy for so long. He's such a talented colorist and he's so versatile too. And, you know, I mean, I, I have loved his work in um, Wasted Space and so many other things, but I think it was uh, Vault's Autumnal that uh, I went, wait a minute, this really emotive painted style is perfect for this because I wanted something that brought the, the character energy out in the colors. That, that was again, the touchstone more so than, the, than finding the right sci-fi vibe. It was finding the right, the right color palette that would set the tone for the characters and their world. And so he brought this really textured, painted, just great i mean the, the 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 colors and it's also so wonderful when you you don't know if an artist and a colorist are going to come together in in, in the right way and wilson and jason's artwork stunning together um it's just really a, a gorgeous book and you really feel these calm moments when the characters are walking through their world or looking up at the stars and um, the cube is always there. This cube spaceship is always up there in the background, but there's these just beautiful moments um, just marred by this one thing. And, and so, yeah, Jason is just, um, just an amazing talent. He just, uh, he, he captured everything in, 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 in perfect way, yeah. Yeah, and then you have Jim Campbell who's handling the letters uh, on the project. I mean, it had to be tough for him after you have these lushly you know painted connected visuals uh it's tricky so it had to be challenging yeah i mean that was that was why it was great to bring on jim because we needed someone who was you know strategic and tactical and just had the level of experience to know exactly how to navigate some of the creative you know complexities that we were playing around with and 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 he he came in and um just nailed it you know the the letters are um i mean and also you're asking someone to say give us a give us a visual style on the lettering that's both sci-fi and heisty and so we need that energy when we're like like you say q mission impossible montage but also can you give us that soft um heartfelt moment under the stars and those are two totally different things so to be able to find the letter that can find the right visual style for all that and, and the placement and uh, yeah Jim knocks it out of the park it's really a great team and and uh you know I couldn't be happier with the look and the style of the book it, I think readers are going to be really uh impressed and really pleased with it well it's slated to be a mini series how many issues are we talking about and do you have more than one arc planned Right now, it's uh, just a mini series. It's just uh, an exciting, uh, you know, uh, high story. Uh, we opted for uh, four um, issues, but the issues are all longer in scope and a little more substantial. And um, uh, I think they all easily go 26 to 28 pages, you know? Um, so it is a, a large, when it's all collected, it will be a larger story. Um, in in feel and it will probably feel more like a a five issue just um we wanted um you know breaking down the structure of the of the series um we had a longer first issue and it just felt like it worked out better to segment it in this way readers would get a good mix it was important that every issue gave readers both these heartfelt moments and the fun sci-fi action adventure qualities and uh, that really required larger issues, so we opted for uh, for four issues. I mean, in terms of uh, will we do more, um, you know, time will tell. Uh, you know, I'm never opposed to returning to a world that fans are hungry to revisit. Um, uh, you know, but but right now it's a, it's a, it's an exciting standalone adventure, and uh, we'll see. So, how did the whole thing end up with Dark Horse? Um. Yeah, uh, we had started working on it uh, before we brought it to Dark Horse. And, um, you know, it was a, a story that I was passionate about. I started to put it together and I had uh, met the editors at Dark Horse, uh, specifically Spencer 
uh, Cushing and Connor uh, Knudsen and uh, really just uh, wanted to bring something to them and um, just loved, um, you know, I love Dark Horse. I've been reading Dark Horse my whole, ever since I got into comics. And, um, and I, you know, I thought this was a great series for Dark Horse because I think Dark Horse is very good at um, stories that are high concept, but character driven. I mean, I think if you look at any Dark Horse series, there's usually a very strong character front and center. And um, so I thought, well, this is a good, uh, a good pairing and a good match. And I shared the idea with them and they loved it. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was just a, a great um, connection. They shared the vision and, and passion for it. And uh, they've been fantastic to work with. It's just been, um, it's just been a joy. And, you know. So who's going to love this book? And no cop-outs. You can't say everyone because you can't tell me flat earthers are going to love your teenage diversity sci-fi comic book. I hope they, they, I don't know what, I'm not a flat earther. They might, <laughs> they might like, the, if a flat earther likes the weird or the, uh, the, the, the alien arrival, uh, the strange beings maybe, but look, I, I, you know, you said, you said something earlier, which was, it's not totally YA. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I think that um, young people will like it. You know, if I was at a convention and a, a young person, a young teenager, or even a pre-teenager came up to me and said, what's this about? I'd say, yeah, you should check this out. I think it's it's viable for younger readers, um, but it's not it's not geared just to them. And I think that, uh, you know, I'm a I'm a, you know, a middle aged uh, guy who likes to uh, read um, teenage adventures. So, I mean, I think that and, and adventures in general and heists in general. So. I think it, you know, I think it's, it's geared for anybody who likes a good action adventure, anyone who likes a good um, heist or prison break or thriller, anyone who likes sci-fi, anyone who likes my work. And I'd finally say anyone who likes to read something that's, that gives just an extra level of thought provoking, um, you know, themes and, and qualities to it. Um, you know, um, it, it, we're not doing, um, it's not, uh, it's not uh, you know literary uh, genius or anything here, but we but it's a it's a fun adventure with a little bit more to it, and so I think that um, you know readers who like that kind of stuff will like it. Well, you have the everybody, the, everybody. That's right, everybody, right? Always everybody. So you have the the sci-fi genre kind of down. It's a, it's a niche you're really comfortable with at this point. So let's get to know Zach a little bit better. So sure. we're experiencing this true golden age of sci-fi right now, where technology has gotten to the point that has brought the development costs down considerably. So we can make kind of any story now. So what's lacking in the niche and where would you like to see things go? What's lacking in, in the sci-fi niche? Are we talking comics or film and TV or what do you think? In, in general, because I know you do have a film background. You know, I think there's so many great, great stories coming out and I we are living in a golden age of stories and a golden age of, of, um, of uh, material. I mean, um, you know, when I look at television, I see things like Severance that just came out on Apple. That's like some weird sci-fi, uh, you know, office story. Or it's grounded, but it's unique and different. Um, there's one Outer Range with Josh Brolin about a void that opens up in someone's backyard. I think that you know there are there is a lot of variety. So you get your Dunes, we get our Blade Runners, we get our uh, Mandalorians, and all the variations there. Um, Marvel is showing, you know, you know, you got Moonlight and um, all the different um, itches that they're scratching. So I, I feel like we we do have a lot of sci-fi. I don't I don't know that I think that something is missing per se. I think that what's important is to continue to to use science fiction for what it's actually supposed to do, which is not just marvel us with amazing spectacle and technology but to make us think about the world we live in, the society we live in, and uh, the time that we live in. And I think that what we're learning just in the past couple of years between the pandemic and now war and all sorts of crazy things that are happening that we didn't know were going to happen, um, this is the time for science fiction to, to explore those new elements, you know, and, and we're going to see the stories that come out over the next five years through different lenses, 
because we're going to have a different perspective on on the world. So I think as the world changes, so too does science fiction um, need to um, take on those changes and, and explore them and talk about them. And, and, and um, that's going to be great science fiction. I feel like the science fiction that we talk about over the next five years will be the, the stuff that does that. So, um, but I don't, I think that there are so many great creators that are up to the challenge and I'm excited to continue to bring those kinds of stories to comics and, um, you know, explore the world. Well, what else would you like to write that's not sci-fi? You know, I've really found a niche in sci-fi <laughs> and I like, I mean, I have um, a number of other series coming out and um, I have, um, I think three more series coming out this year and then more on the way. And quite so, busy. I will, huh? You're quite busy. I am. And so I like the challenge of finding new stories in the sci-fi genre, um, you know, whether it's uh, a teen adventure or a war story or a thriller or a detective or a Western. I mean, you know, Join the Future was a Western. Eclipse was a post-apocalyptic detective story. Port of Earth was a you know, uh, alien arrival business story. So, uh, you know, I like, I like to try to find something new in science fiction. I, you know, I, there's lots of stories I love. I love period stories. I love historical stories. Um, I love, um, gangster stories, you know, um, so I guess anything's possible that you might see me take on something non-science fiction in the future. Um, but I think, probably science fiction for a while but okay. but that science fiction story that you went oh science fiction prison break yeah like that's cool i haven't seen that you know or haven't seen that in a while so hopefully i'll keep surprising readers well several of your stories have already been picked up for tv development we're early on here i know but could you see breakout being made into like a netflix series i sure can no pressure right yeah, uh, I sure can, and 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 um, yeah, time will tell. Um, I think it would be a fantastic TV series. Absolutely, I would love to see that. Well, last question: Give me your one favorite underappreciated sci-fi movie. Oh gosh, underappreciated. Underappreciated. Mine's Event Horizon, for instance. So yeah, yeah, that but that is kind of that is a cult following, doesn't it? Event Horizon, an underappreciated sci-fi. Oh gosh, you caught me off guard on this. Oh. Uh, edit this delay. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I feel like all the ones I like are under un are appreciated. Like, does Altered States is that underappreciated? I mean, that's a really weird, trippy, cool sci-fi for sure uh, story but that has kind of a cult following to it. I mean, um, um, Flight of the Navigator, is that underappreciated? Uh, yeah, I would say so, yeah. Yeah, that's a great, that, you know, that, that was right up there with E.T. I mean, E.T. is maybe a, you know, a little more magical, but uh, Flight of the Navigator was pretty awesome. I mean, who doesn't want to fly a, a spaceship around like that? And um, yeah. Um, I like, you know, here I'm going to like the old Spielbergian kind of, uh, vibe. well, Alter States is weird and trippy. So I'll go with those two. <laughs> well, Zach, it's been a real pleasure to chat with you today about Breakout. Thanks for coming on with us. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I know paper delays are messing with shipping schedules right now, but when can we expect to see Breakout on local comic book shop shelves? Uh, if all goes according to plan, Breakout will be out April 13th. Okay. Uh, we have a, a couple covers for each issue. I strongly recommend with, pa with the paper shortages and everything that's going on, if you are interested in this book, um, call your shop and tell them to reserve a copy and pre-order it. Don't wait for it to be on the shelf. My expectation is that um, this book will probably not be on the shelf if you go into your shop by end of day Wednesday, if not Saturday, you know, I think. So definitely better to pre-order it. and. Um, um, I think the FOC is uh, in, in a week or so. Um, so yeah, and it's, a, it's April 13th, it'll come out. That's absolutely great advice too, to not just from the writer here, folks, but like as, as a consumer, I went in last week, I interviewed somebody who was gonna pick up the book and it was gone. So 
Yeah, shipping and, delays. And, 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 the, and the comics game has changed a little bit in the past year. It's not sure that there will be a reprint or anything like that. And, and I think this is the kind of comic, look, there are some comics where you, you might say, I'll just wait for the trade and you're certainly welcome to do so. Uh, trades are great, I love trades, but um, we're hoping to create something that is is pulpy and engaging in a different in addition to being character driven and thought provoking so i think it's a really perfect kind of a comic to pick up grab in because maybe you'll want to talk about it online or talk at your comic book shop about it or you'll hear them talking about it and it's something that's fun to to be on while it's happening so um another reason to pre-order it yeah i'm i'm hooked i'm looking forward to see how the story unfolds we didn't give away too much which i think is great I, the book will really draw you in. I promise. I, I'm, I'm absolutely certain you'll have fun following all the twists and turns of Breakout. So on behalf of all of us at Comic Book Yeti, this is Byron O'Neill. Thanks for tuning in and take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today for this episode of the Cryptid Creator Corner. We also have a podcast of the same name that you can download wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this episode of the Cryptid Creator Corner, maybe you would enjoy our sister podcast, Into the Comics Cave. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.